Is blockchain really decentralized? In earlier segments, we discussed the pros and cons between centralized and decentralized systems. It's arguable whether decentralizing something is even a good thing, but beyond that, let's examine whether or not blockchain is, in any meaningful way, actually decentralized. In order to talk specifics and cite evidence, we may single out specific cryptos like BTC and ETH, but the same can typically be said for most cryptocurrencies and various other crypto projects. If code is law, then whoever writes the code is the ruler. Blockchain is basically a database, which is created and operated by a specific block of computer code. Computer code is a set of instructions or rules that tells the entire system how to behave. This code is basically the law of blockchain. So, whoever writes the code is the de facto lawgiver. Blockchain code is typically thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lines of instruction, and not easy to read and understand except by those who are programming experts. Crypto proponents argue that the value of blockchain is that, quote, nobody owns the network, and, quote, nobody unilaterally controls the network. That's their idea of things being decentralized, as opposed to governments and other special interests that can impose their will on everybody else. That's the bad thing blockchain supposedly protects us from. But, in reality, are people in the crypto space really protected from private special interests exerting control over the network? Let's take a closer look. While the Bitcoin code is open source and public, what goes in that code is under the control of specific private interests. As of this writing, there are only a handful of people who have access to the source code and the ability to commit code changes. Those with access to the source are associated with for-profit corporations like Chaincode Labs, OKCoin, BitMEX, and Blockstream. There's also an association called MIT's Digital Currency Initiative. The MIT Association lends an air of legitimacy to the guardians of the source, until further investigation reveals that it is funded by Chaincode, BitMEX, Jack Dorsey, and Europe's largest digital asset management company, CoinShares, among others. It would be foolish to not assume the interests of these for-profit companies have an influence over this, quote, association, and are focused more on increasing the value of their stake and less about the technological efficiency in insulating the world from centralization. Which might explain why BTC is one of the least technologically capable versions of crypto, despite being the highest valued. So while on the outside it looks like there's some kind of decentralized association controlling the laws that run blockchain, in reality, it's a small cartel of private corporations. Also, many people think just because a project is open source, that means it's run by the community. This is false. Most open source projects have a master maintainer who has totalitarian control over the project. They are not obligated whatsoever to answer to any community, and most of the developers have other business interests they serve. In fact, many open source projects are only open source because they use code that requires any derivative work to also be open source. There is absolutely no guarantee an open source project has any oversight, nor is there any guarantee that the code is the result of community involvement. With other blockchains like Ethereum, there's an even thinner veneer of decentralization. Ethereum has its de facto king, the original programmer Vitalik Buterin, the community's Pied Piper, upon whose every word is revered. It's 2.0, yo. It's 2.0, yo. It's 2.0, yo. It's 2.0, yo. Logo lock the cathedral. We must coordinate. But we ain't no cathedral. No one subordinate. Every team and every project we could get far. Subvergic biologic, we work like a bazaar. Yeah. <laughs> He's created a nonprofit organization called the Ethereum Foundation, which sounds consensual in theory, but is little more than a marketing company stacked with board members whose main skills seem to be loyalty and willingness to promote Ethereum rather than technology and finance. The real decisions regarding the future of blockchain rest with the development team, which are not in place via any reliable consensus mechanism. Like some other crypto projects, Ethereum has a published process whereby the community can petition to help direct the future of the technology. It's basically an appeal that someone can make, but ultimately it's up to the centralized, very small development team to decide what goes in code and in policy. 
So while there's a mechanism for, quote, consensus to apply to blockchain development, at the end of that hallway is always a small group of overseers who have the final say, and presumably nothing happens without King Vitalik's approval. So in most of these projects, we now know the code, the law, is centralized. What about other aspects of the operation? Is mining decentralized? Satoshi Nakamoto, the original creator of Bitcoin and blockchain, envisioned a diverse, decentralized array of miners, working separately but in tandem to verify the authenticity of transactions on the network. While this sounds great in theory, in practice it never materialized. Recent studies show that even in the early days of crypto, mining was concentrated in the hands of a few operators. All throughout the history of Bitcoin, you had key people and groups controlling almost every aspect of the operation. In the early years, it was the development team and their associates who mined huge quantities of Bitcoin, much of which is still concentrated in large blocks of wealth today. Then, when the price of Bitcoin started to rise, it became more advantageous for miners to form consortiums than to operate independently. Today, the top 5% of mining operations get more than 80% of the block rewards. Let me say that again. The top 5% get more than 80% of the block rewards. It's simply no longer economically viable to operate an independent, decentralized mining rig. Some may argue... This isn't the case for other blockchains, but the main reason is simply because they have such low traffic and their tokens are worth so little, there's no incentive at the moment to consolidate blockchain processing. As soon as a token becomes more valuable, centralization and consolidation happens. This isn't a construct specific to crypto. It happens in every industry. First, there are small groups of early adopters. But as the market grows, big players come in and take over. The same applies with crypto, and there's no way to get around it, especially when it's decentralized and nobody's in charge to make rules against monopolies. Today, we have monopolistic groups controlling most major blockchains. A small handful of mining cartels control the majority of the Bitcoin blockchain. If they decide to collude, they can unilaterally take over Bitcoin's blockchain. This is called a 51% attack. But that's a misnomer. It's not really an attack. It's just math. Whoever controls the majority of the blockchain's processing controls the blockchain. The only alternative, if you don't like what 51% does, is to abandon the blockchain. That's called a fork, and we'll explain that when we address another argument whether blockchain is immutable. So thus far, we've revealed that the code, aka the law, is centralized. We've revealed that the processing of the blockchain itself is centralized. What else is left? Well, how about the infrastructure upon which trades occur? Core infrastructure. One of the principal features of crypto is its peer-to-peer nature. You're supposed to be able to send crypto tokens to anybody, anywhere, without any central or outside influence. In other words, nobody can stop crypto. That's at least the pitch. There are at least two big problems with these claims. The first one is the 800-pound elephant in the room that everybody in crypto ignores. The internet. Crypto people talk as if the internet is some unlimited, unstoppable, free resource like sunlight or wind. They completely take for granted the fact that without evil central governments and centralization, the internet would not exist. The entire infrastructure upon which crypto is based, upon which it is a parasite, depends on a myriad of central authorities to maintain. Nowhere in any crypto's business model is there accommodation made for helping sustain this resource. It's just assumed to always be there, unfettered and unrestricted. Unfortunately, that's not the case. There are thousands of central authorities that determine what happens on the internet, from system administrators at companies and ISPs, to policymakers in government, each of whom have the ability to control or restrict any activity online if they so decide. This is especially true for governments. They are not about to allow anybody to use their resources and undermine their ability to enforce law. We've seen examples over and over of various governments restricting what can and cannot be done online, from taxation of online sales to restriction of online gambling. If government wants to control something, they can. They may not be able to control 100%, but they can control enough to make most systems impractical to use. 
This is especially true for crypto, and blockchain is especially vulnerable because it's not a single dark website that can move around. It's a wide open network of nodes that have to be able to identify each other, making the entire network easily targetable by authorities if needed. Just because things haven't been more tightly controlled doesn't mean they can't or won't. On top of that, there are less than a dozen private corporations that control 90% of most domestic internet traffic and are not in any way legally compelled to handle crypto traffic if they don't want to. If net neutrality hadn't been abolished, things might be a little different. ISPs routinely decide to filter certain ports. Many, for example, won't allow port 25, which is the SMTP port, on their networks without paying extra. They could apply the same policy to Bitcoin and block port 8333 and stop most Bitcoin traffic. You have no constitutionally guaranteed rights on a private corporate network. And that includes the vast majority of the Internet. Beyond the obvious that all crypto depends on government-subsidized infrastructure, from wireless to land-based systems to the centralized IP address and hostname systems, there is still even more centralization going on. Trading Infrastructure Much is touted about crypto's ability to allow people to send tokens directly to each other, but this isn't the typical way crypto is traded. In fact, the vast majority of crypto trades are not even recorded on the blockchain. They are executed on private, centralized exchanges like Binance and Coinbase. While there are ways for people to buy and sell crypto in a peer-to-peer -peer manner with sites like local bitcoins, there's a huge liability using these unregulated facilitators. You're also much more likely to be directly mingling with money launderers and terrorists, and costs can be quite different from the main market prices. You're also very likely to be defrauded or implicated in some illegal activity. CEXs, or centralized exchanges, offer more protection, so this is the preferred way most people trade crypto. So it comes as no surprise to discover the vast majority of crypto transactions happen on centralized exchanges, not on the blockchain. These exchanges are monolithic central authorities, in many cases subject to much less transparency and oversight than traditionally licensed government-regulated brokerage houses. Even countries like El Salvador, who claim to have adopted Bitcoin, are all in actuality operating their own private, centralized exchanges they have exclusive control over. There's no way to tell whether the amount of Bitcoin in their exchange matches with Bitcoin on the blockchain. They can freeze or shut down accounts at will. They can close up shop and take everybody's crypto. And many have including famous rug pulls like Quadringa, where the owner of the exchange mysteriously died and left most of their clients without access to their crypto. Even fiat that's stored on account at these centralized exchanges is not protected from fraud, unlike traditional regulated banks. There's significantly less protection for consumers on these exchanges and significantly less action that can be taken when they're defrauded. So, to summarize, while it sounds great as a talking point, once you examine all the various pieces of the crypto market puzzle, you find they are, in fact, not decentralized. Every step along the way, you will run into powerful private interests that have even more control and less accountability than in traditional markets.